I like to say it like this. Um, as Britney Spears said to her second husband, I won't keep you long. All right, so. <laughs> Write them down. A number of years ago, um, I was preparing to go to a meeting, and uh, and the day before the meeting, I had had some intense fellowship with my wife, and um, we don't argue, but we do have intense moments of fellowship, and so she was she was articulating very specifically some issues that she saw in my life that I needed to deal with, and uh, she did it on three different occasions. And she did it each time in the precise order that she did it before. Ah. And um, and there's a moment in life when, you know, if, if you're if you're a husband, you don't keep information on hard drives. You keep it in RAM, which is volatile. Your wife keeps it in hard drives. And so she could pull up anything, anytime, anywhere, and just bring it back to you. And uh, if you say to her, well, you tell me when, and she says, it was July 12th, you had that black hat on and that red shirt. I mean, how do you deny that? So at that point, you realize, okay, I'm done here. So on her last tirade, uh, just, before I, just before I quoted the passage of scripture, it's better to dwell in the wilderness in a, white, in a house of a contentious woman. Um, that's where I was. Um, it's in there for a reason. I mean, okay. And so I mistakenly prayed these words. Lord, if there's any truth to what this woman is saying, will you confirm it? And then I went back outside. Uh, that morning as I'm walking out the house um, to go to another meeting that she had already complained about, the doorbell rang and at the door were three prophets. Um, and I was surprised to see them there. Two of them were my brothers, one was my cousin, and I, I was, man, come on in. And so I was excited. We were together, and I woke Barbara up, and she fixed breakfast for them, and we fellowship for about an hour. And then ADD reminded me, you know, you have another meeting. And, uh, and I got ready to get up and go, and one of the guys grabbed me by the arm, and he says, you can't go. We came here to minister to you. And... Uh, my wife said, you should have seen yourself. You look, your eyes got this big and you look like somebody whose hand had been caught in the cookie jar. And so they began to, I, I actually speak the same words that she had shared with me in the same order that she had shared with me. Now, I didn't know back in 1973, I'd married a prophet. Uh, I thought I was in a nonprofit ministry. <laughs> But uh, they began to share. At the second point, I was so taken back that they were confirming. And I wanted to say to Barbara, who was sitting next to me, why don't you wait in the room to hear all the, all the men in the, in, of God and I talk. But I didn't have the nerve to do it. And they articulated all five points that she had raised with me. And, and then they said these words. You have a gifted ministry. God's blessed you. He's touched your life. And at various moments, points in your ministry, he has backed you into a corner so he could deal with you. And he let you out. He's let you out. He has you in a corner this time. And if you want to get out, he'll let you out. But he'll never use you again. Wow. Whoa. And I forgot about the meeting and everything else. And I went in. I mean, I just got, got down before God. And I said, God, please, I don't want you not to use me. In order for God not to use you, you have to let God have his way in your life and address any issues going on in your life. Um, I grew up in a Pentecostal holiness church where nothing was legal, but every, everything you didn't see anybody do, you could get away with. I didn't have any mentors. And then when I came into ministry, the mentors that I had were guys who had no morals. And so I was learning a lot of my bad behavior from them. I, 
I had these wonderful gifts that God had given me in terms of communication, preaching, singing, making music, and all of that kind of stuff. And people are more attracted to your charisma than they are to your character. Your wife knows your character, but your congregation doesn't know your character. They just know your principle and they think charisma, they think you're a man of God. And so I began to pursue the heart of God and being right with him. It has not been a perfect journey, but it's been a journey when I'm, I've been willing to say, God, you are right whenever I'm wrong. I'm wrong and you're always right. And God is right whenever he says anything. If he's asking you a question, he's not looking for information. <clears throat> And during the season in my life when I was really stressed about some of the things that were taking place because I felt like God had given me promises and they were not being fulfilled. And so I came into a place where I was praying a prayer on our honeymoon that, uh, God, if you're doing anything on the earth, we want to be part of that. 30 days after that prayer, I was kicked out of the denomination that I was a part of. And so I was just telling God, I feel ripped off. And so... I opened an Amplified Bible, a Bible that I've never used before, and I flipped it open. I said to God like this, I don't know if you guys have ever done this, God, I'm going to open this Bible, and wherever my eyes land, it's going to be you talking to me, so you better be guiding this thing. And so I opened the Bible, and it opened to Jeremiah 15, and in that passage, Jeremiah is complaining to God, and he's telling God off. And so here's a principle that I've learned that might help you. Whenever you can't tell God how you really feel, find somebody in the Bible who told him, and then use their words. Um, and so Jeremiah says to God, why will you be to me like a deceitful brook, like waters that fail and are uncertain? Now, here's the problem, is you tell God what you want him to hear, you have to listen to what he wants you to hear. And in that moment, there was this passage that began and said, thus says the Lord to Jeremiah, if you will give up this mistaken tone of distrust and unworthy suspicions concerning my faithfulness, then I will be to you a brazen wall. Do not return to them, they'll return to you. And I jumped up and I ran into the kitchen and I just said, God just spoke to me. Now here's the thing. It was one of the hardest words I'd ever received from God, but it brought joy. We cannot live in a world of prophets and teachers where we are willing to accept substandard living compared to high quality gifts. We have to say, buy the truth and don't sell it. So for whatever that's worth, you can buy that. Let me just give you a couple of ideas. You cannot preach the word and avoid persecution. You cannot be what God has called you to be without dealing with persecution. Persecution is a conspired effort by people to produce in you a failure to accomplish what you were supposed to accomplish. And when Jesus says to his disciples, when they ask the question, who then can be saved? I mean, it's like... Rich people, how about that? And Jesus says these words. He says, there is no one who has left fathers, mothers, brothers, sisters, children, farms, for my sake and for the gospel, who will not in this life receive how much? One hundredfold. Look at somebody say, one hundredfold is not bad. And then you say, oh, what a word. And then he says, plus persecution. Lust, persecution. Like somebody said, you can't get out of this world without dying. You, you can't proceed in the kingdom of God 
seriously without dealing with persecutions. So good. So good. And the, the need for us to understand, and there's a verse that I, I preached from, read, thought I understood it, didn't like it, but it says, all who will live godly in Christ, Let everybody say all. 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 Now the Greek word for all is the same as the English word. All. <laughs> All who will live godly in Christ must, it is necessary to suffer persecution. No matter what your open, open heaven experience is, you're going to have to deal with something beyond that. When Jesus was baptized, the heavens were opened and a voice spoke out of heaven and said these words. You know them. Come on. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. He comes up out of the waters of baptism, and then the scripture says it one way and then another way. It says, and he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness for the specific purpose of being tempted by the devil. But Mark says it differently. Mark says he was driven by the Spirit. Sometimes he leads you, and sometimes he drives you. <laughs> But the goal is to get you there. But what's in, what for me is important is this, is to recognize that the last thing he heard from the Father is the first thing he heard from the devil. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. What's the first thing the enemy says to him? If you are the son. If you are the son. So you get your prophetic words and they bless you, but then understand there is a wilderness moment that is going to test you with the prophetic word. And recognizing that becomes so critical to us. I think recognizing the power of ridicule to dilute the power of the authentic is so real with us. But, but Tim Sheets, has been talking about how more important it is than these days to pray in tongues. And he said, he had this experience in which he was praying about something and he said, Holy Spirit, show me how to pray this. And he said, the Holy Spirit said, let me pray it for you. Yeah. And I said, oh my God. You ever have an OMG moment and somebody says something and you say, I knew that. I knew that. Why didn't I say that? And so I'm looking at that and I'm realizing you shut down things that you think will have an impact on the body of Christ or upon the world itself. And if I can get you to stop doing the thing that God wants you to do, then I've won. And if I can get you to stop doing it by persecuting you, by ridiculing you, by using humor, by using Facebook and Twitter and all those other things, I'll do it. Now Isaiah 28 says, there are people who have made a covenant with death and hell. And the covenant with death and hell, I believe, has been made already by people in the media. And if you look at CNN, NBC, ABC, all of those, whenever they're talking, they're all using the same word, not just the same talking points, but the same words. And when you use the same words, you can affect people in a number of ways because people start to say, well, everybody is saying that. Well, no, no, not everybody, just them. But everybody is hearing them say it. And so we consequently receive that. We cannot allow ridicule to keep us from doing what we're supposed to do. And you might ask God to give you some deliverance from Facebook. <laughs> I am, I'm a, I'm a member of a great church, and I've got great network relationships, and I've got great fathers and fathers in the faith, and James Gall uh, can gall you many times with, with what goes on many times, but he came to our church, and I was just getting ready to quit going uh, every year to South Africa. And he stands in our pulpit and he says, Bishop Garlington, South Africa, South Africa, South Africa, South Africa, South Africa, South Africa. Did you say it? You remember that? Oh, yeah. I said, God, I was trying to quit. And then he told me what was ahead of me by going. 
I think the thing is, is that many times when I want to quit doing something, God, if he wants you to do it, he'll give you enough reason to do it. Now, when I say I'm, I'm not a member of any particular political party, but I want to have an ability to make a decision in, in a judicious discernment between right and wrong. The issue for us isn't Democrat or Republican. It's not right or left. It's right and wrong. And I want to read a passage of scripture uh, to you from Second Chronicles chapter 19. It's, it's the account of Jehoshaphat coming back from an alliance, an unholy alliance that he had with Ahab. And here's what it says, 19.1. Then Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, returned in safety to his house in Jerusalem. He almost got killed. Je Jehu, the son of Hanani the seer, went out to meet him and said to King Jehoshaphat, should you help the wicked and love those who hate the Lord and so bring wrath on yourself from the Lord? That's what he's saying. But he then says, but there is some good in you. There is some good in you, for you have removed the Asherah from the land, and you have set your heart to seek God. Now, if you'll follow on in that text, you'll find out that Jehoshaphat set up judges and officers and people who could bring the Israel back to God. When he does all of that, in chapter 20, it begins with, and after these things, Moab. I believe we are encountering a new level of opposition because we have a president who has set up judges and justices and some of the other things that we're experiencing and they're having an impact on us. Now, when Patricia King tells us how important it is to be intercessors, I have to close with this. I have five more closes, but I'm going to close. <laughs> I'm going to close with him because I, I want that guitar to start playing. <laughs> A number of years ago, I was in fasting and prayer and intercession for the, the nomination of Clarence for justice, Judge Clarence. And I saw guys raising questions with him about morals who had none. Yeah. And I got so angry and I had a shoe. I was in a hotel room. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to show it. I want to throw it at the screen. And I started shouting at the guy, Tim Kennedy, who couldn't even hear me. And I was saying, you got no right to run. And everybody knows what you've done. And I, and I, and I brought up his sin of Chappaquiddick. And in that moment, the Holy Spirit said, Joseph, I said, yes, sir. He says, you cannot be an authentic intercessor if you count any man's trespasses against him. Wow. In other words, wow. in the throne room, you can't say one thing and come out of the throne room and say something different. Wow. You then become a double agent. Busted. <laughs> no. Go to Ezekiel 33. It was my last point, but Ezekiel 33 says, if a righteous man turns back from his righteousness, his former righteousness will not count in his behalf. He says, but on the other hand, if a wicked man turns from his wickedness and begins to do the right things, not even his wickedness will be counted against him. There are people today who are counting President Trump's wickedness of his past against him, but right now he's doing the right thing. And God is saying, you can count it, but I'm not counting it. Yeah. God bless you. Wow.